So I want to welcome everybody bright and early this morning. Uh, we've got a very busy morning. Um, our uh, presentation we have from Dr. Welch, I'll talk about here in just a second. But right after that, uh, we have six visiting medical student presentations, six. And uh, that means we've got to move pretty expeditiously. Uh, and so we're going to make sure that uh, we indu indeed get started. Uh, by 8 o'clock, and uh, we're going to try to make sure that uh, those that are starting uh, don't get so much time that those who are going to talk a little later don't have any time, which would not be fair. So uh, with that, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Joel Welch. So I've known Joel for a long time, went to medical school here, and then at University of Nebraska where he was a real star, and I had a chance to be visiting professor there and hear about what a, a great job he had done at that institution. So uh, he uh, already knew he wanted to be involved and wanted to be an ophthalmic oncologist, and there's not a lot of people who take that as their primary desire moving forward. And so um, he uh, took the long road and did a full two-year fellowship with the Shields Group at Wills. And those who don't know the Shields Group well, um, if you talk about, you know, the world center of um, ophthalmic oncology, I mean, it has to be the Shields Group. Uh, they handle a, a significant percentage of the entire United States burden of ophthalmic oncology. And at the same time, uh, they also handle a, an amazing amount of uh, oncology in the world. So two years there, and then a full two-year retinal vitreal fellowship. So he's spending them as much time and as uh, about the... About the only one who's decided to take such a long road that I can see is our own Brian Stagg, who's smiling back here right now. But hey, he can beat you a little bit by did, yeah. all of this. So uh, yes, this is a recruitment talk on our part. Uh, the one area that Moran has been lacking has been um, an oncologist. We briefly had one, and then our husband had to leave. We, we love that opportunity, and so we're very excited potentially to make this work out to where we can have that expertise. So uh, with that introduction and presentation, uh, oh, right now his, uh, his uh, retinal vitriol uh, training is at Sacramento at UC Davis. And uh, he will be finishing up that uh, uh, in June of 2020. So with that, I bring you Dr. Wells. Joel? Very well, thank you. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for coming, waking up so early. I know it's early, but uh, thanks Dr. Olson and the department for having me here. And, and I'll never catch up to Brian Stagg, just for the record. And, uh, I'll give up right now. But uh, today I'll be talking about some eye tumors and some amendments, so to speak, to the eye tumor uh, constitution. Um, I have no financial disclosures, of course, uh, but uh, if anybody has any questions, this certainly can be interactive. Feel free to interrupt, uh, ask questions as we go along, okay? So this document on our left was uh, signed uh, over 200 years ago in this building on your right, Independence Hall in Philadelphia. This is, of course, the U.S. Constitution uh, signed there by delegates from 12 of the 13 colonies, Rhode Island uh, didn't send any delegates to that convention. But now if you fast forward over 200 years, uh, up on the upper right is Independence Hall. And if you follow that blue Google Maps trail, it's just a few short footsteps away to get to Will's Eye Hospital. Uh, passing through the square behind Independence Hall, passing by Washington Square, where over 2,000 colonial soldiers are buried, and then just a few, few blocks more until you get to the Will's Eye Hospital. And that's where I came across the eye tumor constitution and spent a couple of years studying that uh, constitution from some of the founding doctors of ocular oncology. It was a tremendous experience. It's a place unlike any other. Uh, the, the, the pathology and, uh, that comes through those doors is really unparalleled, and it was a, a wonderful experience. But I won't be talking about the U.S. Constitution anymore. We'll be talking about this eye tumor constitution, and there are three central articles, so to speak, of the eye tumor constitution, three central tenets. One, this is different than most ophthalmology. Our first priority, of course, is to save life. Uh, followed by saving globes, saving the eye, 
And then we start to think about vision. And this is more or less the credo of ocular oncology uh, of the eye tumor constitution. And there have been several amendments written over the years, of course, and I was lucky to be a part of uh, just a few of them. Uh, so today we'll talk about four of those amendments. One regarding tiny retinoblastoma, OCT of very, very small retinoblastoma tumors. We'll discuss some uveal metastasis, uh, amelanotic choroidal lesions, and then high-risk choroidal nevus. And you'll see these numbers in parentheses next to these amendment titles, and those represent the number of patients in these series. And I'm most grateful to these patients who have really written these amendments, and we're lucky enough to be part of their lives and to learn from them and learn how to help others uh, from them. So this is more or less our schedule. I'll talk about these amendments. I'll, I'll bore you with those amendments, but hopefully excite you with some of these mystery cases. And I was able to acquire yesterday some, uh, I think it's called swag. I'll put this right here. Um, I got some things. If, if anybody can diagnose correctly, let me keep an eye on that one. That one's liable to, to move. If anybody can diagnose these uh, mystery cases correctly, just shout out the diagnosis as soon as you think it or know it. And uh, we'll rely on the room to decide who was first, I guess. But, uh, and then you get some of this University of Utah swag, propaganda, paraphernalia, whatever you want to call it. So let's jump into mystery case number one. It's a young woman, 22 years old, right eye's great, sees well. Left eye has this bizarre lesion invading the anterior chamber, causing some iridodialis and even some lens subluxation there. Gonio shows this white lesion in front of the iris, this striated red and white lesion behind the iris. Anterior segment OCT shows this uh, tumor, perhaps a tumor, maybe I've said too much already, this lens subluxation, and that little island of iris sitting atop this lesion. Have you ever seen? Anything like that, how bizarre. This is UBM, this is ultrasound, maybe a little bit of a density there. Great image here, and uh, fluorescein angiography of the anterior segment. Wonderful image, but maybe not too helpful from a diagnosis standpoint. So we've got this young woman with this large red and white intraocular mass, it's in seemingly involving the ciliary body, and likely the retina, maybe even the choroid. Anterior chamber invasion, it's causing some iridodialysis, some lens subluxation, hypotony. Any guesses? Medulla Medulla, I think that's a great guess. That's a good guess. That's certainly on the differential. I've, I've withheld uh, the complete names of everything on this list, but uh, <laughs> I think the med is down there. I think that was medulla epithelioma. So, We'll keep going, I think that's a great thought. And so what to do with this eye at this point? Well, I'll tell you what we did. They did a fine needle biopsy and the results, oh, of course, we're not gonna give you the results just quite yet, but we did treat the eye and we treated the eye with, well, I can't tell you that either, but one month <laughs> after treatment, the eye looked like this, better, right? Lesion is shrieking, lens is coming back into place, iris is starting to settle back into its place, perhaps. There's still something there. Looking better on UBM and ultrasound, six months. So after six months now, after initiating treatment, there's cataract there, but the lesion is significantly smaller uh, by UBM and uh, of course by ultrasound. Unfortunately, this young woman was lost to follow up for two years. So how did she look when she came back? Well, maybe not too much different, but if you look closer, You'll see some white fluffiness in the anterior chamber, a seed. If you look underneath the eyelid, you'll see these sentinel vessels signifying something uh, lurking beneath. The tumor has recurred, and it looks just as bad as it initially did. So what was this intraocular mass? It, it, uh, the fine needle biopsy had shown that it was actually retinoblastoma. And uh, the treatment was systemic chemotherapy, which caused an initial nice regression, but uh, wasn't enough. And uh, unfortunately, she was lost to follow up, came back two years later. This eye was then promptly enucleated, and uh, histopathology revealed massive uveal invasion 
and uh, more systemic uh, chemotherapy was given. So adult onset retinoblastoma is rare. This is a survey from the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology and globe salvage is rare in these cases. But we've recently published on uh, treating uh, older patients, not necessarily adults, but patients older than five years, uh, including some adults with intra-arterial chemotherapy and found better uh, globe salvage rates, albeit at shorter follow-up. This is an example of that, a 23-year-old gentleman that presented to the Will's Eye emergency room with this lesion diagnosis retinoblastoma and treated with intra-arterial chemotherapy. All right, well, I think Griffin uh, said at least the first diagnosis there, so we'll give him the, wasn't the correct diagnosis, but it was, he was brave enough to say something. Very good. I don't know if it deserves an applause, but uh, no, that's, that's fine. Uh, so instead of talking about large retinoblastoma, adult onset retinoblastoma, which is uh, almost always a group D or a group EI, let's talk about tiny, very small retinoblastoma. This is retinoblastoma that's less than one millimeter thick uh, as we see it clinically. And this is OCT of that. So just a little bit of introduction on retinoblastoma. We're doing quite well, at least in the developed uh, world, these developed countries, where our retinoblastoma cure rates are at an all-time high, almost 100%, which is a far cry from over 150 years ago, where 95% uh, of these kiddos uh, died. But uh, that's how we're doing in the states here and other developed countries, uh, highlighted here the red circle around the mortality rate, just 3%. But if we look at uh, other areas of the world, say Africa uh, and Asia, not including uh, Japan, uh, the Japanese do a great job with retinoblastoma. This paper is from uh, Finland. An uh, uh, ophthalmologist slash mathematician came up with these estimates. But uh, you can see that there's a lot of need around the world, further amendments to the eye tumor constitution. Uh, the worldwide constitution need to be made. Uh, this author also makes the case that we, we think of the most common primary intraocular tumor uh, being uveal melanoma, and that's certainly the case here in America, but worldwide it may not be. He estimates that seven to 8,000 patients per year are diagnosed with retinoblastoma compared to a worldwide estimate of six to 7,000 patients with uveal melanoma. So uh, he argues that retinoblastoma may be worldwide truly the most frequent primary eye cancer. So like I said, there are worldwide amendments to be made to the eye tumor constitution. And here at the Moran, of course, uh, there's a very good reputation for worldwide ophthalmology. And why not add uh, advances in retinoblastoma to the already uh, illustrious reputation of the Moran? Despite knowing all these things about retinoblastoma, there's still a lot that we don't know. Even though retinoblastoma was the first uh, tumor suppressor gene to be mapped, uh, it was the basis for Knudsen's two-hit hypothesis, some fundamental oncology principles here, there's still a lot we don't know. Even what is the true retinoblastoma cell of origin? And consequently, the retinoblastoma retinal layer of origin. This has been a debate over the past, oh, 50 years or so, and recently some authors think that it's the retinal progenitor cell, the RPC, which then sprouts and clonally expands into these retinoblastoma tumors. Others think that it's the RPC and differentiated cone cells. Others think it's a cone precursor. Others think it's a horizontal cell, which then localizes to the inner retinal layer. Others think it's not nothing specific, but certainly the inner nuclear layer, which might be uh, counterintuitive to what we think and feel because we hear about these rosettes and pseudo rosettes, which are have at this differentiated cone morphology on histopathology. So maybe one would intuitively think that these would localize to the outer retinal layer. And some even think that the Mueller cell is the source of retinoblastoma. And it's difficult to nail this down because on histopathology, we rarely see small nascent tumors. Uh, these eyes come to histopathologists looking like this, group D, group B, large tumors that need to be enucleated. 
So it's tough to analyze this histopathologically, but uh, some people have. This paper from 96 showed perhaps an expansion of the inner nuclear layer on histopathology. Galley, certainly an expert in retinoblastoma from Toronto, um, shows this paper uh, with a small retinoblastoma sandwiched in between the outer nuclear layer and the inner nuclear layer on histopathology. So mouse models show expansion of the inner nuclear layer. Here, a mouse model, histopathology, and OCT correlate. Not too easy to get, but they show expansion of the inner nuclear layer, even on OCT. But this is just a mouse model. Is this the same in humans? Here's another good mouse model. This is from Indiana, and uh, good OCT images uh, with histopathology correlation. You can even see the calcification there in these small tumors. And they localize also to the inner uh, nuclear layer. Some OCT studies have been done. Uh, and these authors and papers claim that the inner nuclear layer is the layer of origin, and others claim that the outer nuclear layer, a small nascent tumor you can see there, perhaps starting in the outer nuclear layer. So it's, there's some debate. We decided to look at all the tumors we could find that were less than one millimeter thick and see what we could glean from the OCT analysis. So this, there's no histopathology correlates here because these tumors are small and these eyes should not be enucleated. And so we uh, uh, retrospectively reviewed all of these patients over five years and uh, looked uh, for all these tumors that were less than one millimeter thick that had OCT imaging. And then we did a layer by layer analysis, looked at them. These patients were on average four months old and uh, most of them had bilateral disease, inherited disease. That's not too surprising. That's how you can catch them so young, catch them so early, usually through screening uh, processes. And uh, most of these lesions were posterior to the equator, and uh, most of these lesions were in group B eyes. So this isn't uh, the more advanced group D and group E retinoblastoma. These tumors were small, about two millimeters in diameter, uh, about half a millimeter in uh, thickness. And we thought by analyzing, looking at these images, the three more senior authors on the paper uh, including myself, thought that the majority of these tumors started in the inner nuclear layer, and I'll talk about how we determined that. But there was one tumor that we just couldn't decide if it was inner versus outer nuclear layer. I'll show you a picture of that. And we found these um, OCT features of retinoblastoma, uh, of which I'll discuss, fishtail, shark fin, and of course this tumor calcification. Well, if you see a small retinoblastoma tumor, uh, it's no surprise that retinoblastoma <coughs> can have calcification. You can see a big chunk of it here, causing that shadowing uh, posteriorly. And then you can also, also see this micro uh, calcification causing these uh, vertical shadow artifacts on our OCT. Well, what about these kind of silly names, shark fin and fishtail signs? Let's take a look at these. Just go with me here, uh, with an eye of faith, look at these pictures. But if, if you imagine drawing, look at this area, but if you imagine drawing a line uh, in between the inner nuclear layer and the inner plexiform layer, and then another line around the lateral edge of the tumor, then another line between the inner nuclear layer and the outer plexiform layer, you might, like I said, with an eye of faith, see what looks somewhat like a fishtail. Um, and you can maybe see evidence of that in these small tumors. It's really just the expansion of that inner nuclear layer as it perhaps gives birth to these tumors. And you can see small fishtails uh, in these uh, tumors, OCTs. The shark fin, I think, is more obvious, where if you draw a line between the outer nuclear layer and the outer plexiform layer, you get this shape, looks like a wave or maybe even a shark fin. Now, like I say, it's just a silly name, but I think these names might mean something. You can see these waves or shark fins on several of these tumors, uh, something that we just couldn't ignore. And what do these mean? Uh, you can see maybe both of these signs on several of these tumors as well. So does this help us determine layer of origin? I think it might. Say you have this fishtail, and it's not hard to imagine that that could represent that the inner nuclear layer has expanded. Um, and given rise to this tumor. Uh, and it begs the question, what on earth is this tumor doing in the inter internuclear layer if we've always thought it was a cone or a cone precursor? But uh, 
What about the shark fin sign? What's it doing to the outer nuclear layer? Well, we hypothesize that as this tumor grows, it invades and sort of distorts <coughs> or bends the contents of the outer nuclear layer around the tumor margin, and that's what gives you that hyporeflective wave or that hyporeflective shark fin. Maybe you can see that here where the inner nuclear layer expands onto this tumor. Uh, and then the tumor kind of invades and displaces some of the contents of the outer nuclear layer, causing that wave or that shark fin. And here's a couple other examples of that that uh, may or may not be, be evident. But uh, back 20 years ago, Dr. Galley had mentioned something similar, even with histopathology analysis saying that uh, it appears as though this tumor might be in the outer nuclear layer, but on histopathology, close inspection reveals that the nuclei have INL features and that the retinoblastoma has invaded and distorted the outer nuclear layer. And even Wintersteiner, over 100 years ago, some histopathology drawings may have alluded to some inner nuclear layer fishtail signs all that time ago. So I think OCT is very useful in characterizing submillimeter retinoblastoma, not necessarily what we've talked about here, but even tracking its response to our treatments. We think that retinoblastoma may originate in the inner nuclear layer. These signs may or may not help us uh, determine that, and uh, of course, future work is needed. Just some other uh, reports on how OCT is useful. This was a very resistant retinoblastoma, so after systemic chemotherapy, the tumor looked like it had regressed well, but then uh, the tumor recurred. Whenever you see these cysts uh, marked by these white arrows, uh, we have seen that from time to time in a chemo-resistant retinoblastoma. Chemo-resistant because it's probably a very well-differentiated tumor, and there's not a lot of cell tumor turnover, but there is some, and that's perhaps why it would be chemo and maybe even radio-resistant. So after intraarterial chemotherapy, again, we thought we had good regression. This is a vert vertical scan through the tumor. You can see some of the calcified scar there underneath the retinal tissue. But the tumor recurred after a few months. And so what do we have left in our quiver after systemic chemotherapy and after <clears throat> intraarterial chemotherapy? Well, we would use a radioactive plaque in that setting. And the tumor uh, finally regressed and was stable at, at follow-up last <coughs> that I checked in on this patient. So OCT was somewhat helpful there. How about for retinoblastoma seeding? Here's a, a vitreous seed of retinoblastoma tumor cells sitting on top of the macula. And uh, we've started doing this precision intravitreal chemotherapy where you actually inject under indirect ophthalmos ophthalmoscopy to localize the load of your of your chemotherapy, and uh, we can see that uh, you know that vitreous seed was no longer visible by clinical fundoscopy and by OCT. And then this cloud of vitreous seeding above a tumor scar that you can see on the lower images here uh, disappeared after. Um, but you do see some uh, melphalan retinopathy there uh, in the lower left image with that kind of salt and pepper retina appearance. Uh, here's another uh, tumor that grew while being on systemic chemotherapy. These are two tumors, actually, B and C. And then uh, we treated them with transpupillary thermotherapy, enhanced by, actually, IV endocyanin green. It's kind of a poor man's uh, PDT, if you will. And then this is an interesting case of a lesion where intraarterial chemotherapy was given to the right eye, but we saw a very small but some response to contralateral intraarterial chemotherapy in the fellow eye, suggesting that there is some systemic absorption of that uh, supposedly local uh, treatment. So we've talked about retinoblastoma. I've bored you enough with that amendment to the eye tumor constitution. Let's go back to a mystery case. Again, Joel. Yes. Would that mean systemic absorption, or would that imply that it actually is circulating to the other eye? I think yes, yes, and yes. I, so I think uh, uh, we give it to, to say the right eye in that situation. Some of the, the melphalan gets, of course, out of that eye into the systemic circulation and then into the left eye through bloodstream. So, and then there have been reports of even the effects of 
melphalan and these drugs for, we use for intra-arterial chemotherapy affecting uh, other tissues that are undergoing you know, rapid proliferation or clonal proliferation like the gonads. If you give too much melphalan, systemically certainly, or even with IAC, you can induce sterility, so you have to be quite careful. Good. Mystery case number two. We've got a frisbee, a kind of blowhorn type thing, and a, what's this called? A cup koozie? Thanks. These guys, are, these guys are on top of it. Mystery case number two, and this is kind of choose your adventure. So I'll tell you that it's an older woman. Vision is down. Uh, this is a throwback to my youth, but I'm going to let all of you be the heroes of this story. What do I mean by that? Well, Choose your, what would you like to see on this patient? First, we'll look at the right eye. Go ahead, anybody, can, you don't get a prize for shouting this out, but just shout something out. Slit lamp. Let's do slit lamp, I like it. So there are some prominent scleral and conge vessels, the cornea is clear, the iris has this diffuse, lumpy appearance, and there is significant cataract. That's likely what's causing the vision loss, but you can see these dilated, torturous vessels here. So we've got our slit lamp exam, gave us some good information. What's next? What do you want to do? UBM. Wants the UBM. I like it. I like it. Let's look at this UBM. This is the right eye at 12 o'clock. I think that that ciliary body is thickened. Um, this It's not so obvious here. And you can maybe see this iris pigment epithelium cyst right, right behind the iris. I called it out there. So that's 12 o'clock. We didn't see too many vessels in that area. 6 o'clock, there's definite thickening of the ciliary body, kind of this diffuse thickening of the ciliary body. Eight o'clock, even thicker. And then a 130 transverse, you see that thickened ciliary body flanking the iris here, and then several of these large IPE or iris pigment epithelium cysts. A bizarre UBM. Good. Anything else? B scan. Let's look at the B scan. Pretty normal. In that, uh, in that right eye. I won't belabor it too much, but uh, you can see increased pigmentation in the angle and even this kind of clearish lesion invading the angle. And maybe you can appreciate the lumpy appearance of this iris, probably from all those cysts sitting underneath the iris. Very well. Uh, on dilated fundus exam, we see this pigmented lesion. On autofluorescence, we see that pigmented lesion with some autofluorescence now. OCT, nothing too abnormal at the macula, but uh, there is some hyper reflectivity of that lesion and kind of the surrounding choroid when we scan through that peripheral lesion. Not the best quality study, but certainly something there. So that was the right eye. Bizarre, right? Wouldn't it be bizarre if we saw all the same things in the left eye? Well, we do. Lumpy iris, increased angle pigmentation, uh, thickening of the ciliary body with iris pigment epithelium cysts causing that lumpy iris appearance. But here in this left eye, we see scattered little spots of pigment. Uh, and then inferotemporally, we see a larger uh, area of elevation and pigmentation of the choroid. And that does have some thickness. And OCT, there's maybe this focal area of thickening in that spot there. Okay, so uh, past medical history, ah, she has stage four endometrial cancer. And uh, progression despite multiple therapies. So she's got active stage four uh, genitourinary cancer. So uh, we'll forego the joke and the trivia uh, and just jump to our differential, uh, our assessment differential diagnosis. We've talked and shown pictures of all these things, this uh, amelanotic angle mass in the right eye, the vision's down, thick ciliary body in both eyes, multiple ice, IPE cysts in both eyes, cataracts in both eyes, and irregular uh, choroidal pigment in both eyes. So what's on our different, could this be metastasis to both eyes in a very symmetric manner? Could this be melanoma? Could this be uveal fusion, uveal lymphoma? Or could it be something perineoplastic? That's the big hint. If you were to just look at this eye and describe it, you might describe it as it's a bilateral process. These lesions seem to be pigmented or uh, 
melanocytic. It seems to be diffusely occurring through the eye, and uh, we might get to a diagnosis here, bilateral diffuse uveal melanocytic proliferation, a very odd presentation of a very odd diagnosis. So odd on top of odd, that's tough. So originally described by Makamur, there are these five cardinal signs by gas, but they don't necessarily have to occur. Uh, as we saw in our case. So when do we see B-dump? Well, almost never, but when we do see it, it's in older people, mostly women with urogenital cancers. If it's in a man, they'll uh, probably have had or have a lung cancer. In 44% of cases, uh, the previous cancer, or sorry, the underlying cancer was previously diagnosed. These are just some histopathology images showing finding similar to our case with that thickening of the cellular body, these IPE cysts, IPE cysts here. This is an image from UCLA, a good uh, medical retina, a doc and group down there uh, showing these IPE cysts and looks, uh, you know, astoundingly similar to our case. So I don't have any doubt that that's the diagnosis. And that was anterior segment OCT. Who do I give it to on that one? What do you guys think? Nobody? Randy said slit lamp. So the slit lamp was first. Yeah, that's right. Let's, uh, <laughs> he, he is a oh, gee. Dr. Olsen <laughs> out, on, out on the ranch, yeah. keeping, a, there you go. keeping his Diet Coke nice and cool there. Good. There you go. Very well. Good. So now let's go back to our amendments. Uh, you can guys get a little bit of a nap in here for this early morning. This paper was presented at ASRS just a few weeks ago, at the end of July, and uh, this is one of my favorite papers um, regarding uveal metastasis. And we wrote four papers from this series of over a thousand patients with uveal metastasis, uh, papers regarding timing of primary cancer diagnosis, patient uh, sex, patient age, and then what the primary cancer diagnosis was. And um, I was at the bookstore yesterday, and there was this feeling of freshness as the new semester was starting yesterday uh, down on lower campus. And I thought, well, it's no better time than now for a pop quiz uh, for this new semester. So what percentage of patients with uveal metastasis present with undiagnosed primary cancer? What do you think? We'll get to these answers. If a man, if a male presents with uveal metastasis and undiagnosed primary cancer, then uh, the most likely primary site will be? Ooh. If a female presents, that was easy. You guys are all over that. If a female presents with uveal metastasis and undiagnosed primary cancer, the most likely primary site is? Breast. Ooh, I like it. Uh, mean interval between primary cancer diagnosis and uveal metastasis is longest for which type of cancer? We'll uh, go over these answers. Five-year survival estimates are better if the primary cancer is diagnosed before uveal metastasis compared to if you see the metastasis and then send them for the workup to find, find the primary lesion. Well, this paper is really just a continuation of a paper that was published over 20 years ago. This uh, series had about 400 patients in it. Now, 20 years later, there's over 1,000 patients in uh, the SHIELDS database with uveal metastasis. So we looked at all those patients, looked at demographics, clinical features, timing of primary cancer diagnosis, whether that was before, after, or never in relation to uveal metastasis, and overall survival based on timing of primary cancer diagnosis. Really just those questions I was asking. Over 1,000 patients with all these lesions. And we found that if the primary cancer was known, that was about two-thirds of cases versus one-third had undiagnosed primary cancer. A slight age difference between these groups. There's certainly a, uh, a gender or a sex difference between the two and a laterality difference. So primary cancer site, if the primary cancer is known, it's most often women with breast cancer. I don't think that's any secret. Uh, but if the uh, primary site is undiagnosed, then it's most often a lung cancer. Uh, but quite often, the primary cancer is, is never identified, at least in this series. So how is this helpful for us when we're examining a patient who doesn't have any cancer history and we see something that looks like uveal metastasis in the eye? We ask, well, do you have cancer? They say no. So what's our job? It's to get on the phone with either a primary care doctor or a medical oncologist if they have it, 
and say, this patient needs a systemic workup and it's nice and you sound really smart if you can say, you know what, start by looking at the, well, if it's a man, just like everybody unanimous, unanimously said, if it's a man, you need to look at the lung. Eight out of 10 of those patients will have a lung lesion. But surprisingly, uh, followed by a small amount with, with GI, surprisingly, the majority of breast cancer and, and uveal metastasis from breast cancer mets uh, um, is diagnosed. The primary cancer is diagnosed. 95 to 97% of the time, that primary breast cancer is already diagnosed because we have such good screening for breast cancers. We don't have as good a screening for these lung cancers. So if somebody comes in with a uveal metastasis, a woman comes in with uveal metastasis and they don't have a primary cancer diagnosis, it's more likely to be lung even in those cases, which is uh, interesting. This is probably my favorite uh, slide from all of fellowships, something we put together. But uh, two thirds of these patients will have known primary cancer. The majority of those will still be breast cancer. So the majority of uveal metastasis, of course, is still breast cancer. But in those who we don't know the primary cancer diagnosis, we may never learn it, or if we do, then more often than not, it's lung cancer. So on the phone, you should say start, just playing pure numbers, both men and women, you say start by looking at the lung. And they'll say, well, how do you know that? And then you just say, just trust me, you know. You don't tell them that you have the data, but you just have a feeling. Um, so just the other day this happened, this patient came in with a skull base lesion from ENT, he had some tongue issues, weakness on, on the left side, MRI showed this enhancing skull base lesion here, MRI also showed, uh, the vision was 20-20 in this side, but MRI also showed that there's this enhancing ocular mass, we get a call from ENT, they're saying, this gentleman has what's likely a primary eye tumor with a skull base metastasis, we need you guys to take a look. What do you think? And even over the phone, that story just doesn't necessarily work. A primary eye tumor that metastasis in the skull base, we'd never see that. It's a 40-year-old. It might, primary eye tumor, is it a melanoma? Well, that, I've never seen that go to the skull base. That usually goes to the liver, you know? And, and so it just doesn't sound right. So everybody say, yeah, sure, we'll see the patient. You look inside the eye, the vision is good. Um, he does maybe endorse some symptoms here, and, uh, but you can see this large collection of subretinal fluid, this exudative choroidal lesion. On B-scan, it looks like this. It's uh, uh, kind of a diffusely thickened, uh, homogenous to normal choroid, not necessarily hollow uh, lesion on B-scan. And this all looks like a metastasis. So it's a 40-year-old man, and just playing numbers, you would say, get on the phone and say, you know, I don't think this is an eye, a primary eye tumor. In fact, I would he needs a systemic workup, and you start by looking at the lung, and sure enough, he has a lung lesion here on his PET scan. So what percentage of patients with uveal metastasis present with undiagnosed primary cancer? 33% uh, start by looking at the lung, even in women, look at the lung if the primary cancer is undiagnosed. But, you know, a quarter of them also did have breast cancer, so. Um, the mean interval now is longest for which type of cancer? Well. Mean interval is 5.2 years overall, somewhat longer for breast and really quite long for thyroid. This is an interesting uh, finding here. Why so long for thyroid? And then relatively short for lung and GI tumors. And regarding the survival estimates, whether it's diagnosed before or after the uveal metastasis, turns out stage four disease is stage four disease no matter when we see the metastasis and the survival rates really aren't affected by when we look in the eye. So this isn't too surprising, uh, but there's no survival difference between these two groups on a five-year Kaplan-Meier estimate. And what about if we never diagnose this? Uh, similarly, the, the never diagnosed group is a little bit underpowered here, but, but there's also no difference in survival, at least at five years. And there's some other survival data here that we won't go over. So the take-home points today are really the answers to the questions that uh, we've posed in our pop quiz, two-thirds of these patients have a known primary cancer diagnosis. If it's not known, start by looking at the lung in men and women. The mean interval from primary cancer diagnosis to uveal metastasis was relatively short for lung and GI cancers, relatively long for breast and thyroid cancers. No difference in five-year survival, depending on the timing of when we diagnose these tumors in the eye. Very well, so let's get back to a mystery case. Something for everybody here. Let's move to the anterior 
segment, maybe even the ocular surface or orbit. You tell me. This is a young kiddo, five years old. Doesn't look too bad, but when you revert that eyelid, you see this bizarre pedunculated lesion. And you think, oh, this is kind of an odd looking, what? What do you guys think this is? Anybody? What could this be? We know it's not a conjunctivitis because I probably wouldn't be presenting on that, but uh, <laughs> maybe I'd present on a papilloma. That's what we thought. This is a bizarre papilloma in a kiddo. But by the time we get to the operating room to remove this lesion, it had grown significantly. And I was scrubbing in with Carol Shield, and she said, that's, that growth is much too rapid. The diagnosis is this. She said it, and I said, well, okay. Uh, histopathology comes back uh, showing these findings. Immunohistochemistry, cytoplasmic uh, uptake here of Desmond, nuclear uptake of myogenin. It's a rhabdo. It's a rhabdo. Hey, we, we got to give that. We got to, he's going to get two things here. You guys got to catch up with it. This is botryoid rhabdomyosarcoma of the conjunctiva in a young boy. Right behind you was Dr. Petty. Yeah, yeah, so he, he, he was right there. He, he was right. I'll let you guys fight over No, no, he's I want, to, I want the megaphone. <laughs> Yell at the residents. He's, he's broadcasting for us, yeah. That's right. You guys nailed that. That's a bizarre appearing rhabdo of the conch in a young kiddo. He's doing great um, on follow-up. All right, a quick paper on amelanotic choroidal lesions. I know we're jumping all over the place, but there's good learning in some of this, I think. This paper was published in BJO uh, earlier this year. It's presented at the International Society of Ocular Oncology in LA in March, and it uh, even won best uh, paper of the day there. We were proud of that. So you look at these lesions, and these present to you in your clinic. If you have some of the founding doctors, some of the writers of the eye tumor constitution at your side, then diagnosing these lesions isn't difficult. Uh, but say you don't have those doctors at your side at all times, then these lesions can be somewhat perplexing. And you can go read about all these amelanotic choroidal lesions, but that would take quite a bit of time. So wouldn't it be nice if there was a one-stop amelanotic shop where you could find all the info you need, maybe not all the info, but a lot of the info you need on these lesions. And it's important to get it right. Another question here because two, maybe three of these lesions may induce poor life prognosis for the patient. Anybody, any guesses on which of those lesions, which of these lesions could have poor life prognosis? I would go with A. A doesn't look good. Um, and then uh, I would go with C. C also doesn't look good. That's a metastasis. And even F. What on earth is F? Well, we'll talk about what F is. Um, so the methods, we looked at all amelanotic choroidal lesions over a 45-year time period. The inclusion criteria was if this lesion looked more than 50% amelanotic, we included it. So it was a very inclusive study. And that's how we got up to 4,000 patients. Looked at demographics, clinical features, stratified by age, sex, and basal diameter, and compared them to amelanotic melanoma. This is quite an undertaking, especially in a clinic that is still clinging on to paper charts. So looking through paper charts for all of these lesions, that's what happened here. And it uh, was quite the undertaking. Found all these patients and looked at mean age for all of these lesions. So what are we talking about? We're talking about amelanotic melanomas, nevi, metastasis, choroidal hemangiomas. Uh, so amelanotic doesn't necessarily mean yellow. It could be like a red or an orange appearance. And so we have PEHCR, which that's peripheral exudative hemorrhagic choroidal retinopathy, which more commonly presents kind of pigmented or red or kind of blood-like in its appearance. But uh, it can be amelanotic due to the exudative part. Sclerochroidal calcification, that was the F that we saw in the picture before. Choroidal osteoma, granuloma, lymphoma, then there are inflammatory lesions that make it into a tumor clinic. Solitary idiopathic choroiditis, which is a misnomer, but that's the diagnosis. Uh, some other lesions, including um, like a scleritis, a posterior scleritis, or a uvula effusion. I think those were the types of lesions that were in that other group. So mean age of melanoma is different from other, other lesions, and it's best seen here on this age distribution graphic, where melanoma presents at a mean age of 57 years, at least amelanotic melanoma, and that's 
significantly older than these lesions and significantly younger than patients with these other lesions here. We'll talk about this more, but what about patient sex? Well, amelanotic melanoma is kind of split uh, down the middle, and then we compared these other ones to amelanotic melanoma. And uh, nevus, uh, amelanotic nevus, um, there were more females in that group, uh, in the metastasis group as well, in the osteoma group as well. So that fits with kind of our understanding. What about the size of these lesions? Well, the melanomas were significantly bigger than most everything else. But from a uh, basal diameter standpoint, smaller than just one of these other lesions. And that's kind of this diffusely uh, infiltrating uh, uveal lymphoma which has a wider base, but certainly a smaller thickness compared to melanoma. And that lesion can look like this, this kind of diffuse orangish infiltration of the uvea, of the choroid in this, in this picture. What about location in the eye? Melanoma was on average uh, 3.5 millimeters from the disc. Uh, lesions that were more posterior were metastasis, hemangioma, osteoma and lymphoma, albeit that was quite diffuse in its presentation. Usually lesions that were more in the periphery were nevus and certainly this peripheral uh, exudative hemorrhagic choroidal retinopathy and sclerochoroidal calcification. So I think this is the real strength of the paper. If you're in a clinic and you see a lesion, it's amelanotic, you don't know what it is. Well, if you know the age, if you know uh, the patient's sex, and if you can get an estimate on the size of the lesion, you can come to this chart, which is in the paper, and say, well, it might be this. So if it's a younger male and it's a smaller lesion, then uh, odds are that it might be a hemangioma. You might be able to diagnose that without a paper like this, but this at least gets some other things in your mind. Versus if it's an older woman and it has a similar, smaller appearance, this could be a nevus, it could be that sclerochoroidal calcification, or it could be PEHCR, but you can see that melanoma is really quite, quite rare in that age group. And it's important to get it right because life prognosis may be poor for some of these diagnoses. Melanoma, the five-year survival estimate is 85% uh, and even lower for metastasis. So don't overlook uh, your patients with metastasis because their survival is even lower than those with uh, eye melanoma. And it seems that these more dangerous diagnoses are clustered around this age group, 55 to 65 years old, but don't overlook sclerochoidal calcification. If this occurs in a patient with uh, hyperparathyroidism, that can be fatal, that can be quite dangerous. So if you see this lesion in the eye, which is uh, um, that calcification we saw kind of in the lower, I guess second from the left on the bottom, then you might want to be careful. There are limitations to our study. I won't get into those, but just like any other, there are limitations. So it's, this paper is kind of a one-stop shop for amelanotic choroidal lesions uh, stratified by age, sex, and lesion size. And it's really just a tool for helping us making, uh, in making accurate life-saving diagnostic and management decisions. Okay, for more of the retina people in the crowd, let's go through this mystery case. We got a Frisbee here as our last prize. Um, it's a 63-year-old woman in the right eye. You see these yeah, yellowish appearing lesions. Uh, it looks deep to the retina, deep to those vessels, certainly in the left eye. And autofluorescence, wow, well, they're quite uh, autofluorescent, hyper-autofluorescent there. And they even seem to have this hypopion appearance, almost like there's this li lipofusin hypopion in both eyes boat-shaped, subretinal, lipofusion deposits that are hypofluorescent on fluorescein angiography. So they're blocking the underlying choroidal fluorescence here. That's what's happening. OCT vertical scan, you can see how that lipofusion is kind of gathered in this dependent fashion, causing that hypopion appearance. And uh, this is the Claris image I was talking about with uh, your photographer earlier. This is after treatment now. Things are looking better. The OCT is looking better in both eyes as well. Any thoughts on the diagnosis here? It's a tough one. Is this a tumor or is this a perineoplastic ocular finding? Excellent, I love it. Um, yes, uh, exudative perineoplastic vitelliform maculopathy, just like Dr. Vitelli said. This patient had cutaneous 
melanoma. So something about her melanoma is causing her eyes to do this. So you treat the melanoma, cutaneous melanoma, now we can treat them with these checkpoint inhibitors. She did quite well from that standpoint. Well, how do we treat the eye? Uh, this patient had uh, several episodes of plasmapheresis to get that regression that we saw in, in the previous uh, OCTs. That's great. All right. I was worried I was going to have to take some of this stuff home, but. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, my dog will love this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dog. Good. Excellent. So you got these mystery cases were no. No problem for this group, and that's not surprising. So let's finish here with some bread and butter ocular oncology. This is high-risk choroidal nevus, and we're hopefully, most of us, are familiar with this mnemonic. Came out, this version of it came out 10 years ago to find small ocular melanoma using helpful hints daily. That's regarding, you're looking at a pigmented lesion in the back of the eye, and you're wondering when you see this patient, is this lesion going to grow? Do I need to be worried about this? So that's what this is assessing. <coughs> Risk factors for growth, nevus growth. And if you have one or two of these features, it's probably safe to follow the lesion, at least initially. Then if you see growth, certainly refer. But if you have three or more of these features, then you'd probably want to refer to somebody who looks at a lot of these. That was essentially the gist of this paper from 2009. It was a continuation of work uh, from before, which just had the TFSOM part of the mnemonic. Uh, but this was in an era of more clinical exam, and we're moving more and more into multimodal imaging. And so these findings weren't based on our imaging. The subretinal fluid diagnosis was a clinical diagnosis, not necessarily an OCT diagnosis. And um, the orange pigment was a clinical diagnosis, and not necessarily. The orange pigment equals lipofusion accumulation, which equals hyperautofluorescence. So nowadays, we kind of really lean on our autofluorescence for our orange pigment. So did we need to reassess these risk factors in the era of multimodal imaging? I don't know if we needed to do it, but certainly it was done. And uh, we looked at these uh, features uh, with multimodal imaging, published a few papers and revised the mnemonic a little bit. There were some aspects of the old mnemonic which uh, I and we, others, didn't necessarily love, like that margin close to the optic nerve. We didn't necessarily love that. And this halo absent thing where, you know, this depigmented halo of a nevus was actually a good sign, but if it was gone, was that a bad sign? Well, it, it, it's rare to begin with, so maybe it didn't belong in the mnemonic, but it came out on this multivariable analysis, and so it was included in the paper. So reassessing these things using multimodal imaging and some clinical features, uh, there's this new mnemonic, which is gaining some strength that's more or less the same, but includes some other things now. It's still thickness as determined on ultrasound, fluid now as determined by OCT, uh, symptoms, that's just clinically, of course, with vision less than or equal to 2050, orange pigment mostly determined by autofluorescence, and of course, we still use our hollow ultrasound uh, finding for melanoma or for high-risk nevus. And now diameter, if the diameter is greater than five millimeters on your clinical exam or on your fundus photography. And this could have important in implications, especially as we move forward and say artificial intelligence where we're using imaging to maybe screen uh, many, many patients than we can examine clinically. And the results here are great, great and easy to remember. So this five-year estimate for tumor, uh, for nevus growth, zero factors, there's very little chance that that thing's gonna grow. But if you have one factor, it's 11. Two factors, that's 22. Three factors, it's just a little bit above 33, so isn't that nice? The four factors kind of gets thrown off, but then we get back to our pattern with the five factors at 55%. So that's real nice and easy to remember when you're looking at one of these lesions in, in the eye and you think, okay, this thing is, is has a 22% chance of growing over the next five years. And further than that, we looked at every combination of all of these uh, nevi and, and then did a Kaplan-Meier analysis and determined based on all these different combinations which are listed across the bottom of these signs or findings in the eye, what's the five-year estimate for growth? And uh, let's do an example. This is a younger a woman. 
Um, it's not necessarily, it's kind of right on the borderline. It's almost two millimeters thick, but we'll say it's under. Uh, fluid by OCT, you can see on our top right symptoms, even though there was this little bit of subretinal fluid, still seeing better than 2050. Uh, definitely some orange pigment uh, with that hyper autofluorescence on autofluorescence imaging. And definitely hollow as we look at that B scan, A scan would reveal it to be hollow as well, of course. And the diameter is um, larger than uh, five millimeters as well. So when we look at this lesion, uh, uh, we find it here and find that there's 47% Kaplan-Meier five-year estimate for growth. And uh, that fits, because I think we said that there were four symptoms, so it's right around that 40 or 51%, whatever it was. And so this is a little bit older woman. This is that halo. This is the depigmented halo around an So that's that halo that was talked about in that original mnemonic. Didn't necessarily make it into this mnemonic, but this isn't as thick as that other lesion, certainly less than two millimeters. There's no fluid by OCT. There's no symptoms here. There's no orange pigment. Some of us might be fooled by that depigmented halo, but that's not true lipofusion. That's not true orange pigment. That's just some choroidal depigmentation there. And it's not, it's you know, somewhat hyperautofluorescent, but not the brilliant hyperautofluorescence that you see with lipofusion or orange pigment accumulation. It's maybe a little bit hollow on that B scan and uh, A scan if, if you did it. And then diameter is larger than five millimeters. So we have two of these findings here and that those specific findings of hollowness and uh, diameter equate to a 28% chance for growth over the next five years. So I find this paper to be useful. If you have, you can uh, look at a lesion and determine how dangerous is this lesion. And you'll see that there are certain combinations of these findings that really are quite dangerous that have a 100% estimate for growth over five years. So I think that's a nice and pretty valuable paper. Very well. So we've talked about high-risk nevus here. That's bread and butter, uh, red, uh, bread and butter ocular oncology. So thank you for uh, dancing with me through these mystery cases and through these amendments. Uh, these are diagnoses that I uh, truly love and these, these types of patients I, I also love and enjoy as well. And um, let's remember that it's the patients that are writing the amendments and we're lucky enough to be included in their lives and to be their doctors. And I think that the next amendments to the eye tumor constitution, there's no reason why those amendments shouldn't be written by the patients of the Inner Mountain West uh, through the doctors here at the Moran Eye Center and adding to the worldwide eye tumor constitution, uh, constitution as well. So thank you for your time.